So where is our recording? Hi, everybody. This is Joe Flick from the State Library, and I'm not 100% sure we are recording. Are you seeing the recording button? Um, a notice? It did pop up. I, yeah. Oh, good. All right. Then I guess we are recording. Thanks for, thanks for joining us today. I'm Joe Flick with the Montana State Library. I'm just facilitating today. Um, your presenter is our State Librarian, Jenny Stapp, so I'm going to turn things over to her. Great. Thanks, Joe, and hello, everyone. First, I want to apologize for having to cancel our website chat a couple weeks ago on very, very short notice. Like Joe said, we try to hold these chats every month when there's newsy information to share. Our, our typical schedule is the second Friday of the month because that's the Friday that will follow when the State Library Commission has their meetings they meet every other month. And this week, this month, I had an urgent request from the governor's budget office. And of course, those are important priorities as we get ready to move into the legislative session. So apologize for that and, and thanks for your flexibility. And I'm glad you were able to join me here today. I do want to spend just a few minutes talking about some of the discussions from the October commission meeting. And uh, I did post that agenda in the chat and, and it sounds like maybe we need to repost some of those links so um, you have access to that information. Um, it was a kind of a, a lengthy commission meeting um, as the commission started considering some legislative actions and we can talk about those here in just a few minutes. Uh, a few highlights that I wanted to point out for you. We shared with the commission the State Library's fiscal year 20 annual report. And uh, Joy provided a link to that annual report in the chat as well. Um, if you haven't looked at the State Library's annual report in a couple of years, I encourage you to just take a look at it. The format uses a tool from Esri, the GIS company that we work with, called a story map. And I'm sure you've seen more and more story maps coming out of the State Library as we continue to develop and enhance uh, our data reporting and tools that we use to tell the story of the good work that we do. So you'll see that format for our annual report. Uh, if you're not as familiar with the State Library organizational structure and some of the other services that we offer, the annual report gives a nice overview of who we are as an organization, the various programs and services that we offer. So that's a great way for you to familiarize yourself with what those services are. And then it shares some of the highlights of the work over this past year uh, from our various programs. So for example, there's nice information there about um, some of our GIS data work to collect what's called LIDAR data data that we use to help map the elevation of the state of Montana um, down to uh, really centimeter levels, which is pretty amazing. And then that helps us map things like stream flow and floodplains. It helps to do fire management planning. Um, so a unique aspect to the work of the state library. Um, information about our ongoing development of the Aspen application that you're all familiar with now, uh, which helps us help serve as our library directory and help manage information about continuing education and programming. And um, other kinds of programs, lots of information about the state library's activities related to the COVID-19 pandemic. Joe's great work uh, with census champions. I wanted to talk about that just a, a little bit more as well, a little bit later in the chat, but I encourage you to take a look at this story map if you're interested in the activities of the state life of the past year. Also included in the commission meeting was an overview of the FY20 Library Federations annual reports. Uh, I think most of you are familiar with library federations, the six regions in the state that support the libraries in those areas. They come together to support regional collaboration and continuing education and learning. 
these federations receive grant funds through the State Library Commission and federations are required to every year submit a plan of service to the commission that documents how federation libraries plan to spend those grant funds. And then once a year, the federation coordinators work with all of you to prepare reports back to the commission on how those dollars were spent. Uh, we have a, a whole new tool uh, that we are using to replace our federation report. Thanks, Joe. Um, and if you attended federation meetings this year, you've probably seen this new federation report dashboard. Uh, we're starting to roll out more and more of these kinds of dashboards to really give a very visual way to help understand information about our services and services in your libraries and in your communities. It's pretty striking when you look at the information in the Federation report at exactly where these federations are spending their dollars, you can see that a significant percentage of dollars are spent on um, the resource sharing and technology. And largely uh, what's included in that category are things like OCLC, the Montana Shared Catalog, um, Montana Library to Go, and things like computer purchases in your libraries. This kind of information then can be very helpful as we think about how we can best leverage those dollars and help plan with federations for use of that money is most effectively in the future. Um, I hope you'll take some time to explore the federation dashboard, um, learn a little bit more about what's going on in other federations around you and um, just be thinking about the future of, of Federation dollars and, and how we might continue to maximize their, their investment in the state. Joe gave a great overview of the work of libraries in Montana to help support a complete count through the 2020 census. And similarly, we have a really nice dashboard that Joe and Jessica Edwards created to talk about the work of the census champions. I think about 47 Montana libraries were active participants in a census champions cohort that Joe created that uh, helped communities focus on getting a complete count. As we know, the, the counting process has now come to an end. It was a rather tumultuous end, um, but I just couldn't be happier and more excited about the work that libraries did to support that very critical democratic process that goes on every 10 years. Libraries were recognized as uh, real leads in the state to support the census and census activities. So shout out kudos to all of you who participated. A huge shout out to Fallon County and the great publicity that they received through CBS News. You can see that video link there through this, this dashboard. It was really um, exciting to see the focus on rural communities, what the census means to rural communities, and how Stacy and her library were working to support the census in their community. And shout out to Joe for representing the state library on the state complete count committee, making sure that we were kept abreast of all of the changes that occurred throughout the census this year. Uh, and making sure that that information was communicated effectively to all of you and to help all of you think about and plan for and promote the libraries. I think for a lot of our libraries, and this is just Joe, you know, working with the, this group, and we had such a great plan of activities that were going to happen in April, and then COVID happened in April instead, but um, how they just adjusted and um, and, and were flexible and figured out ways to keep helping their community. And I think ultimately um, Montana did meet its goal for reaching 60% uh, response by self-response, even there, though there were so many changes in how self-response, I mean, people didn't get um, uh, information actually delivered to them 
because of COVID until July. So um, the libraries were really doing their part to get that information out, sticking stuff in book bags that people were picking up curbside as soon as they were back up and doing that service and making sure people knew that their Wi-Fi um, was available in the parking lot. You didn't even have to come into the library. So it was really, um, I think, a great effort and, and good for libraries to get recognized as the community helpers that they are in with Absolutely. In, in civic responsibilities like this. So it was, I think, a, a, a nice eye opener for the people on this complete count committee, the statewide complete count committee to see um, how much libraries have, have can have an impact on, on stuff like this. Montana's count is, you know, likely to be <laughs> Um, litigated, I think, is what we we're all expecting. But, you know, still, I think we got numbers in that we never would have gotten in without libraries. So I think kudos to all true. the libraries. And just one more note about the census, even though the, the count has concluded, like Joe said, we may see some ongoing litigation. Um, one of the next steps is to learn from the census what that official census count will be for the state of Montana. I think typically that count is announced in April or so. Is that, Joe, do you happen to know? I know they, they shoot to start compiling those numbers and having some preliminary numbers by the end of the year, but yeah, yeah an official that, count is released and the spring. Apportionment redistricting committee will begin their work um, next right. April. They're also really hoping to work um, engage with libraries to uh, because the, part of the way that uh, the apportionment redistricting committee works is that they um, require quite a bit of community engagement in that process in Montana and of course uh, now there the, several of those people were on the complete count committee they're like well I guess we could be working with libraries more to try to mm -hmm. get that um, community engagement piece done. So we're looking forward to um, working with them next spring and um, having libraries be the sites of uh, town hall meetings, style meetings, and information, getting information out to people about the apportionment redistricting process. It's like democracy in action. It's really cool. <laughs> Also, the other reason why we're waiting for that official count to come out is that count is the basis for the amount of state aid funding that is then shared amongst libraries. The statute that governs state aid said that says that the uh, statutory appropriation is 40 cent per capita based on the official decennial census. And the, when that legislation was first enacted, the census count was somewhere 980,000 people, something like that. And so we do anticipate uh, an increase in the, the total population for Montana. And so whatever that official count is determined to be will then set the basis for that statutory appropriation. Uh, we won't know exactly what the count is at the start of the legislative session. And so going in, we'll likely be using some estimates from the last year or two to, to, to have some kind of basis for a statutory appropriation in the state budget as that state budget is prepared. And then sometime during the legislative session, we should get that official count from the census and we'll likely then need to go in and make budget updates during that legislative process to make sure that uh, that census count is reflected in that statutory appropriation so that libraries then receive an increased amount of state aid starting next fiscal year. Something else that we're looking at uh, as, as the as the So Stacy Moore also is also on the on the on the call and um, she just said to say thanks for um, the fact that we kind of did a, you did a shout out to Fallon County for their um, world premiere on CBS News. Fantastic. <laughs> Stacy, you were- Television are... ready. This, the commission also received an update on the 
Trust for Montana Libraries, um, the nonprofit that we established just about a year ago now. Um, that trust is up and running and um, the board itself has been on a little bit of a hiatus as a result of the pandemic. Um, but over the summer, we did receive a grant from the Steel Reese Foundation to help support the hotspot lending program that we launched as a result of the pandemic. That was a $20,000 grant from the Steel Reese Foundation. So it was great to get support from that foundation. The board of the trust is meeting again next week. And uh, the trust has, I hope, enough money now for us to think about contracting with a grant writer to continue the process of securing some operational funds to continue to raise monies to support the statewide work that the State Library supports for all of you um, with a long-term goal of establishing more of an endowment to continue to support those kinds of statewide activities. So nice to see that organization uh, beginning to get its footing. And then just one more quick note about commission activities. We had put on pause the process of revising the public library standards. Most of you know that a year ago we had a task force seated that was drafting revisions to the public library standards that exist in administrative rule that libraries meet in order to qualify for state funding. In February, the commission had adopted a draft revision of those standards. And in the spring, we were in the process of gathering public comment about those standards when the pandemic hit. And as a result, we felt like we needed to put that process on pause to really understand more about how the pandemic may be shaping the future of library services in ways that we need to take into account with regard to the standards. That task force met again in September and is once again going through the process of evaluating those standards. I can tell you there'll be some relatively significant changes to the draft standards from what you saw last spring, um, taking into, into account the public comment we had received to date, uh, continuing a focus on what we need to think about in terms of services that we're offering to our patrons that might look different when libraries are closed, when we're offering more online and digital services and so forth. That task force has another meeting coming up in November. And from there, we hope to have a revised, revised, revised set of draft standards to go to the commission at their December commission meeting. And from there, we will once again relaunch a public comment period. Uh, if you recall from the, the timeline that we had previously established, there's actually two public comment periods a public comment period that is um, providing public comment back to the commission on the draft standards. And from that process, then the commission would move the draft standards forward into an administrative rules process by which the standards become the official standards documented in Montana's administrative rules. That process also requires a public comment period. So two public comment periods, um, likely pushing back adoption of the standards themselves by about a year. We had anticipated that hopefully by this coming December meeting that the commission would be adopting those official standards. We're now delaying that process by about a year. Um, so more information to come there, but our hope again is to have newly revised set of draft standards to the commission at their December commission. I'm gonna pause there and ask if there's any questions or comments about activities from the commission meeting. And shout out to Connie, one of our new commissioners. Hi Connie, thanks for joining us. You can say hi, <laughs> she's waving. Um, and I don't see anything in the chat box, but you're welcome to unmute your mic and 
jump in if you have any questions or comments. All right, well, let's talk a little bit about what we know and what we don't know about the upcoming legislative session. There is a lot that we don't know and a lot that I hope will be decided very shortly after the election. One of the things we really don't know is just what the, the look of the legislative session is going to be. Undoubtedly, some component of it will be online, um, whether or not it's uh, fully online or a hybrid session is one of the discussion points that the legislature is considering. There's also a lot of rumors about whether or not the legislature might focus the legislative session on budgetary issues and issues pertaining to the pandemic only and limit any kind of legislation pertaining to policy. The, the legislation's constitutional priority is to pass a budget. That's the one thing they have to do every biennium. Um, that's really the only thing they have to do every biennium. Obviously, they, they have a lot of other activities that go on. Um, but one suggestion is that they focus their priorities on passing a budget and, and pandemic priorities. And given concerns over participation and how to ensure uh, access to a hybrid legislative session that the legislature not take on any additional policy bills this session. Again, that's a decision that hasn't been made, but would likely be made shortly after the, the election. There's some other rumors too about potentially shortening the legislative session, not meeting for a full 90 days and potentially saving days if a special session is needed later on. Another rumor I've heard is that they might come into session in January and then go immediately into a recess and recess until March or April when potentially there is a vaccine and the legislature could come back together in person. So lots of discussion about what the session might look like, the focus of the session going forward. And I hope to have some answers about what that will look like in the next uh, several weeks to month. One thing we do know is that the State Library will not be working with the Library Association to host an in-person open house as we've always done during the legislative session. So we will not be hosting that library legislative night. Um, we're working with the Montana Library Association Government Affairs Committee to reimagine what options might look like that libraries might consider locally. Um, and I hope that we'll consider having a library issues caucus with legislators where we're meeting with legislators virtually on a regular basis to alert them to uh, library issues and concerns, legislation that might impact libraries and so forth. I think the state library will plan a virtual kind of lunch and learn series for legislators. Uh, where we're providing information to them on topics that are relevant to the commission uh, through the information resources and online applications that we make available. So we're beginning to plan those kinds of activities. Uh, but again, any kind of solid plans really can't be finalized until we have a better sense of what the session itself is going to look like. Any, any questions about the session itself? I have a question. This is Connie. Um, with the virtual lunch and learn series, I mean, you definitely tell us when it'd be helpful to have one of uh, the library, you know, community members at large there. Then I have our board members or trustees there. Would it be beneficial that they also hear the issues at the same time that the legislators? Do? I think that's a fantastic idea, Connie. And I think as we're not only inviting them, but as we're thinking about what those topics might be, having board members weigh in on, on how they see those issues playing out in their communities might be mm -hmm. really, really relevant. Let me give you an example. 
uh, I'll talk about this in more detail in just a second, but we're planning um, to propose legislation to conduct a study of the, the state of broadband in Montana and what the legislature might do about that. Um, so I, undoubtedly we will have a, a session focused on broadband and to be able to have librarians and, and board members participate in that and talk about the importance of broadband, broadband access in your communities, making it really relevant to legislators, I think would be fantastic. I think some of my board members uh, just don't have awareness about that issue either, and it would be great education for them to Super. also hear from everyone there. Super. I have another question, but this might be half a placeholder parking lot for okay. in a minute. Um, how do we, and what talk is there, how do we anticipate changes if Gianforte comes into office? And I'm thinking about that particularly from the public health perspective, but also from budgetary perspective. So maybe that is a parking lot kind of thing. Yeah, let me, let, I'm just gonna write that down so I can back up. Actually, this is Joe. There's a comment in the chat box. Do you see it, Jenny? I do, yeah. Let, let's hold that for just a second. I have a few more legislative topics I wanna get to, and then we can talk a little bit about, about what we're hearing. So um, you've heard me talk now for about a year and a half about House Bill 633, which was a bill um, passed by the 2019 legislative session that called for the legislature to conduct a study of the state library's funding and to propose alternative sources of revenue for the state library. That study concluded in September with the Legislative Finance Committee unanimously taking action to support three proposals. And uh, I put links into the chat, Joe, if you wanna repost them. The Legislative Finance Committee adopted two bills that will be carried as legislative bills in the 2021 session, each of which would appropriate a different source of funding to the state library to help us support our digital library services. The first source of funding is the state's 911 fund. If you're not familiar with that, we all pay about a dollar on all of our phone bills that is collected by the state that's used to fund 911 services, including the, the public safety answering points in our communities and other kinds of 911 services. If this legislation is passed, it would appropriate $450,000 to the State Library to help us support your local governments to collect address data for your communities to support what's called next generation 911. Future 911 systems are going to be built on geographic information systems. So they're actually using GIS and GPS technology to locate emergencies and better direct emergency services. That necessitates that local governments have very precise GIS data about all of the addresses in your communities, as well as all the transportation routes in your communities. And right now, only a handful of counties have data that meets the standards to support those kinds of systems. So this funding would allow us to work with your local governments to help collect that kind of data and to continually assess the data to make sure it meets those standards to support 911 in your communities. And then the second piece of legislation would increase a funding source that the state library already has. Um, there is state statute for what's called a recordation fee. And um, it pertains to any time someone files a, a, an official record with a local government. Largely those are associated with property records. For example, when you purchase a piece of property and you do your, your title filings with your local government, but there's any number of types of official records that can be filed, including just basic public notices. Um, when Ever we file those kinds of records, there is a seven or eight dollar fee for each page. And most of those dollars stay with your county to help support the activities of the clerks and recorders in our counties, things like records management needs and that kind of thing. 
right now, one dollar of those fees is appropriated for developing GIS information. Twenty-five cents of that stays with your local counties to help them support GIS information. Seventy-five cents comes to the state library to help us support our digital library services and to offer a grant program back to your local governments. The legislation that the LFC will carry would double that fee from $1 to $2 and $1.50 of that would come to the state library to continue to enhance those kinds of services um, to make sure that we're collecting up-to-date and developing up-to-date geographic information and that we have the funding necessary to keep the online applications like our cadastral application, for example, up and available and, and useful for everyone in the state. Those are the two pieces of legislation that are moving forward. And then the third action that the Legislative Finance Committee took was to make a recommendation to the governor's budget office to increase funding to the state library in the governor's budget through some fees that would be assessed on state agencies. And the governor's office is currently considering how to enact that recommendation. The commission, took two actions during their commission meeting. One was to send letters of appreciation to the Legislative Finance Committee for those actions, and then to send a letter of endorsement to the governor's office, endorsing the action to include funding in the governor's budget for the state library. So all in all, we're pretty, pretty hopeful and optimistic that the state library could see um, some increase in funding from these various um, pieces of legislation and budget action. And then finally, the, the other piece of information with regard to the legislature that I wanted to share pertains to a study that the Library Association Government Affairs Committee and the State Library is proposing to look at uh, the state of broadband, as I mentioned, and what the legislature might do about this. Um, if you're not familiar with study bills, they're a, a process that the legislature goes through where legislation is evaluated and passed like any other kind of legislation. Um, it's a way for the legislature to prioritize issues of importance that they want to study during an interim with the intent of proposing future legislation that could be adopted in a subsequent legislative session. So the study bill that we're proposing would ask the legislature to look at the broadband needs that exist in Montana, to set broadband goals for the state of Montana, to evaluate governance and oversight that would help the state achieve those broadband goals, to consider sources of funding to help achieve those goals, to look at model legislation and model governance from other states that might inform how Montana might approach addressing the concerns of broadband in our state and how to uh, create public-private partnerships, especially with our telecommunication providers to help support broadband. At this point in time, we've reached out to a wide variety of stakeholders that we know have interest in broadband. Um, of course, the Library Association, the Office of the Commissioner of Higher Ed, the Office of Public Instruction, the Montana Telecommunications Association, various school associations, um, the Montana Economic Developers Association, and a number of others. Um, we're hearing support for the idea of a study. And so our intent is after the election to hold a meeting of stakeholders to see if we can come to agreement on the exact language of a study bill that would then be proposed and, and hopefully carried through the legislative session. We have had one legislator, Representative Pat Flowers, express interest in the election to get additional sponsors as well. It is a two-step process. It's a longer term process to try to get the state to invest in, in broadband more deliberately. 
and some stakeholders have said that they are concerned about that, that they'd like to see more action sooner. And of course we would too. There's no reason why a study bill couldn't be carried in parallel with a bill that would actually ask for funding and more deliberate action to be adopted in this coming legislative session, um, in which case a study bill could essentially serve as a backup bill in case that legislation didn't go anywhere. And so we're also having conversations with stakeholders around a, a more rapid timeline. Uh, in my experience, broadband is something that has been incredibly contentious, which is why we really haven't seen any kind of legislative action to date. And when the legislature is faced with those kinds of contentious issues, it's very typical for them to take this kind of study approach where they use a two year interim period to really study the issues to come to the best possible recommendations before proposing actual legislation and hopefully funding. Why is it so contentious? Um, largely because uh, you know, the, the more fiscally conservative block believes that we should allow the free market to resolve broadband issues and, and, and in areas where there are more providers, you can have half a dozen different broadband providers in an area and um, you know, they, they compete with one another to provide the best possible service you know, at reasonable prices that is eco economically advantageous to the private sector. So the argument has always been that the government should not overstep uh, into this area, that we should let our private telecommunication providers resolve the issue. Any other questions about the study bill or any other um, questions related to the legislature? I know MLA is planning to do some more outreach and education just on how to uh, monitor bills during the legislative session. Um, you'll certainly be hearing more from the Government Affairs Committee uh, in terms of how to reach out to your legislators, how to engage with them before the session, the importance of reaching out to them during the session when we're hearing activities on bills related to the library. So look for more information from them as well. So let's talk a little bit about um, Susie's question about the mask mandate and anything else we might be hearing relative to a, a possible change in, in governor's administration. Um, to the question of the mask mandate, um, there, there is a um, private sector, a, um, you know, a push from just within the private sector communities to reverse the mask mandate. I'm sure some of you've heard about a group that's traveling the state raising money to challenge the, um, the legal authority of the governor on the mask mandate. Um, so that effort is underway and I, you know, I'm sure we'll probably end up in the courts. Um, but for now, the governor's mask mandate does stand until a court were to reverse it um, or a new governor came into office and um, chose a different policy. Um, but for now, um, the message from the governor's office is that um, his mask mandate stands, uh, the extent to which people are enforcing that mask mandate certainly varies across the state, but he is putting more resources into helping support local governments to enforce the mask mandate and to address any kinds of challenges that we're seeing. Um, and I don't, I certainly don't anticipate that that would change while Bullock is in office. Like I said, unless some kind of legal challenge came quickly and the courts ordered him to um, reverse his decision about the mass mandate. I would be surprised about that. I think the, the constitution is fairly clear on his authority. Um, 
Um, Connie, when I said private sector, I, I stumbled because I don't, I don't think, well, I mean, there's sort of a business community. Um, there's a, a local developer who's leading this effort to challenge the governor's mass mandate. And um, he's enlisted an attorney, Chris Gallus, who's been involved in um, opposing the state's dark money legislation, for example. Um, they are the group that is traveling the state opposing the mass mandate and raising money for litigation. Um, I don't know to what extent they're trying to rally support from the business community, but I imagine there's some effort underway. I guess if we're, if our um, policy then could be also challenged at the library if the state mandate goes away. Absolutely. So if we should be prepared if, for that. If the state mandate goes away, I think this is the important point I wanted to make. In absence of a state mandate, then your local county policies apply and the policies of your local boards apply. The, the Montana law is very clear that um, the local governments have the authority to establish laws and policies in the absence of any overarching state policies or mandates. Mm -hmm. So if, for example, Gianforte decided that he did not want to enforce a mass mandate, um, I don't think he has the authority to say local governments cannot mm -hmm. enforce a mass mandate. We would go back to the processes that we had in place prior to the governor's mask mandate. So your local policies would then apply. Okay. Trying to get my head around if, um, because my board is not unanimously, I mean, the policy is passed, but it's not a unanimous pass. So I feel like it's just not a great situation when the statewide mandate is not there, but I'm trying to get my head around if it is our policy is challenged or um, legally challenged or something like that. I think, I guess we just have to be prepared to not have in-person services because that's just, I think you're the right. Reality of it. Right, Connie. And Susie's going through a, a challenge to her mask mandate right now. Um, you know, I, what we're seeing is just because the, ma the current mask mandate is fairly vague um, and there haven't been a lot of resources put behind enforcing it, we're still seeing differing levels of interpretation. And, you know, I think some people um, still concerned that there's not enough resources to allow law enforcement to adequately enforce it, despite what the governor's been, been saying about making additional resources available. Um, so it, it's put everybody in a really challenging position right now. And then lots of uncertainty about what a change in administration might do going forward. You know, the, the other thing to think about is whether or not the presidential election might change the mass mandate and whether or not we might have a federal mandate for everyone. So it's definitely a, a shifting landscape, but um, I think my advice to all of you would be make sure you have good, clear policies in place. You're following those policies now that um, you know, your boards are clear on what those policies are, your, your local governing bodies and your law enforcement are all clear on what those policies are. And then refer back to what your policies were prior to the governor's mask mandate, because in the absence of that kind of mandate, um, you would be looking at those kinds of policies that you had starting from the beginning of the pandemic. Connie, you asked about budget related to Gianforte as well. Um, so whether or not Gianforte or Cooney were to um, be elected, Governor Bullock will issue a budget is the and then the legislature begins to evaluate that budget. But a new governor has the 
opportunity to come in and propose a completely new budget. Um, and so that Cooney could propose his own budget separate from what Bullock proposed. Uh, undoubtedly, Gian Forte would propose his own budget. So it will be very important for the State Library to engage with Gian Forte and his transition team very early on to make sure that they are aware of the importance of the services that we're offering, um, make sure that they are aware that the recommendations from the legislature for the State Library budget were proposed by Republican legislators and that they have um, good bipartisan support uh, in the hopes that uh, Gene Forte would look favorably on those recommendations as he's developing his budget. Jenny, you were talking about libraries helping um, the government obtain statistics about the communities. Um, I guess I, I needed a little bit more clarification. I didn't really understand just exactly what that was all about. Nancy, are you are you talking about with regard to the um, community in, engagement around like a, a legislative issues, lunch and learn kind of thing? Well, earlier on, when you were talking about the legislatures, you were talking about libraries helping obtain information. Um, I, I think you may be- I missed um, part of it, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Um, if, I'm, if this isn't what, what you're, you're questioning, let me know. But I had said that the State Library is planning to offer some like lunch and learn kind of series uh, virtually with legislators to talk about issues of importance to the legislature and that we'd be using our online information and applications to share information relative to those topics. And we had a discussion about including local librarians and local library boards in those sessions. And I suggested that depending on the topic, there might be an opportunity for local libraries to talk about how that issue plays out in your local communities. And I use the example of broadband um, and, and what broadband availability looks like in your communities to convey that to our local legislators. Is that, was that what you were thinking about? No, um, there was something else and I didn't understand it enough to even write it down. <laughs> And that was, I should have just like jumped right in and said, clarify this. Yeah. <laughs> That's okay. If somebody else, if you can remind, if anybody else can remind me what I said, I can clarify. I just can't remember right now. Was it about the census data, getting more community input about the census data? No, I, I, I don't think so. Cause she was talking about census and this was some other little, um, thing that's okay. I'm sure at some you'll, point in time it'll come up and I'll it, it'll you'll, you'll have an aha moment and then just reach out. I think that covers everything I wanted to cover today. Lots of great questions, so thank you for those. Anything else that? want to visit about things you're hearing about from the State Library that I didn't touch on or further clarification on anything that I did. How are you all doing? Is everybody hanging in there? Well, as I, t I told Joe, I says, you know, the snow melted, so now we don't have to shovel. So things are good. That's right. That's right. There's one comment in the chat that a librarian is tired of disciplining adults. <laughs> I hear you. Yeah, we, these are these are definitely difficult times. We do have a um, anticipating and hearing so many librarians talk about the difficulty in communicating um, policies and enforcing policies. We do have a session coming up at the fall workshops on believe it's the 17th and it's on um, communicating uh, with customers, customer service and de-escalation techniques on it uh, is, the, is the topic. And we've hired an expert presenter. I've, I've been to his training before 
um, Andrew Sanderbeck, and he's going to spend three hours on this topic. So that's great. Yeah, it it's so hard when the direction in, in some cases is left interpretation, um, or people are hearing what they want to hear, and people aren't willing to stand up and say, "No, this is what I really mean." And Stacy says that she's grateful to be at work providing services to our patrons and and I know that they appreciate that. Um, I think that's the other thing is that libraries are really working hard to try to um, navigate this uncertain landscape and figure out how to provide services and keep people safe. Mm -hmm. I was going to try to share this really funny picture. Maybe you guys have seen it, but I have to have to email it to myself. So send it on a different device. <laughs> if I can do this. Multiple devices. Um, and I'm with, I think with that, I'm going to go ahead and unless you want to save the the you want to be live for your for your share, Jenny. <laughs> it's it, it's probably not share worthy or <laughs> recording worthy. Let me tell you. All right. Well, um, we're and just one more comment from West Yellowstone that they are have had a super busy summer and looking forward to Yellowstone closing off for the season. Um, and like Stacy, they're grateful to be open. So great. And thanks everybody for attending. Um, we will be. We probably won't be doing a website chat in November, will we? Well, I was thinking about that. Yeah. With three holidays, we may not. And then I think um, that in was December, fun. we'll want to bring Nanette in to talk about MLA's legislative focus. So we may not, especially since this one kind of ran late into the into October. So yeah, we'll be um, we'll be posting that to the Aspen website. And of course, I always post to the to the MLA's listserv wired. So um, uh, that's where you look for the next website chat. So as soon as Stacy, uh, um, you're not Jenny, Jenny, <laughs> Stacy and Tracy. Um, and I have a, a date set, we'll have it in the Aspen calendar for you. And um, with that, I'm gonna stop our recording. And if you are watching our recording, you may certainly claim credit, uh, CE credit for watching the recording today. And so go ahead and just find that credit in Aspen on under the date of October 30th and claim your credit. Thanks everybody. And we will stay online here for those of you who are live a little bit longer. Is that your 